The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God truthfully, and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a coin. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. And they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for the gift of your Spirit working in our lives, drawing us here to hear your word, to receive your means of grace. So we pray, Lord, in the midst of all that is going on in life, you would Stop the distractions so we could focus solely and wholly on you and your word and your will for our lives and then by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us strength to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you may not know this about me, but I'm a bit of a NASCAR fan. I mean, boogity, boogity, boogity is in my blood. I grew up around the short tracks of southern and uh, central Wisconsin. My grandfather raced, my second cousin's races, my uncle uh, raced. So racing has always been a part of my life. Well, NASCAR has this thing called silly season, and it's in full swing right now. And like any race, it comes with a lot of twists and turns, and they aren't all left-hand turns either. Silly season is the unknown time in a driver's life, especially for those who are not under contract. Do they have a ride uh, for next year, a car to drive for next year? Will they be on the same team? Or will another team come and snag them? Do they have sponsorship? Lord knows it takes a lot of money for that to happen. For some of these drivers, it's like taking them all the way back to elementary school, standing on the playground as the teams are being picked for kickball and wondering if they are ever going to get picked. Do you remember that feeling? Now, there have been some wow moments that came out of silly season that fans would have never, ever expected. Driver or team changes, crew chief swamping, sponsor dropping. And as Forrest Gump would say, Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. But the very title, Silly Season, seems a bit silly to me because, frankly, it seems to be a pretty serious season. But I suppose the reason for the title is because you just can't make some of this stuff up. Now, doesn't that seem like life right now? Hmm? Hurricanes, floods, fires... Injustices being exposed uh, in destructive and divisive ways. A political season causing even more division. Oh, and let's just add a pandemic on top of all of that for the fun of it. I mean, Lord have mercy, if this is what 2020 is, what in the world is 2021 going to be like? Now, for us optimists, we say, bring it. It can only get better. And then we follow that up with, oh, for the sweet love of Jesus, let it be so. And the people say, amen. amen. <laughs> yeah. This is an interesting time in the life of Jesus. I mean, I know all of his life was interesting, but here he is, nearing the end of his earthly ministry. And he seems to be constantly scratching the chalkboard of the norms and expectations of the religious leaders. And there is good reason for that. We've heard the questions being asked over the past several weeks, beginning with that first one of, by what authority do you do these things? I mean, who do you think you are? This Jesus needs to be stopped, all this silliness that he's doing. 
But this isn't silly season for Jesus. It is a serious time dealing with a serious matter. Salvation itself is about to be sacrificed and nailed to the cross. And the question from last week we had is, are you going to the banquet? Where is your loyalty? Who is your God? Who or what saves you? Rulers and things of this world or Jesus? Is all too much for the Pharisees and the rulers. So they, they set out to trick Jesus and they're very crafty about it. You ever experience people like that? They butter you up, soften you up, sweeten you up a little bit, and then they ask you this seemingly in, innocent uh, question only to discover it had ulterior motives. Well, what's the issue? Well, you know, the Pharisees, they're devout Jews. They prided themselves in following the law. They opposed paying taxes to Rome, and they weren't particularly fond of Caesar either. And then you got the Herodians. They were also Jews, but they supported Rome. They didn't have any issues paying the taxes. In fact, their relationship proved to be beneficial at times with the leaders. So you see this dilemma Jesus has in answering the question that is set before him today? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because it's a trap. If Jesus says yes, the Pharisees at a minimum would have him declared unfaithful to Israel and he would implicate himself and they would arrest him. If Jesus says no, then the Herodians would report him and he'd be charged as a traitor. Yet, Jesus is wise beyond all comprehension. Wise beyond all human ability. And he knows, he knows very well what they are up to. He knows the consequences of his response because he knows the mission he is on from the Father himself. So his response isn't it interesting how Jesus always asks a question when he's being questioned? <laughs> but his response, show me the money, he says. Whose picture? Whose image? What's the inscription? Caesar's. Well then, it belongs to Caesar. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to him what's owed him. I mean, that's your civil responsibility. Pharisees, if your faith is offended by the inscription, then give it back to Caesar. Herodians, you know, if you're seeking power and, and favors, then give it to Caesar. But, hey, before we conclude this conversation, render to God the things that are God's. The word we hear today is not a political statement, but a faith statement. A faith confession. Our ears may hear it with that political agenda to which it's probably likely that's how the Pharisees and the Herodians heard it because paying taxes to Rome at the time was, was a real big hot topic. But if there's one thing we know about Jesus, he is, his agenda is always about the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't seek to have us dishonor our civil responsibilities. We are, after all, in the world. But 1 John reminds us we are in the world, but not of the world. We're resident aliens, and heaven is our home. We have this dual citizenship. Earth is where we reside for now, and we seek to glorify God until that day when he comes again, or we go to him. Jesus is always seeking to teach us about the kingdom of God, to reveal the Father to us and his love for us, showing us the way, the truth, and the life, translating what it means for us to live faithfully as his disciples, to instruct us on what it means to be called by name. Called by name in the waters of our baptism. I mean, the world isn't bad. God created it and said it was good. But sin does have an effect on what God intended. 
You know, we can get sucked into the world. We know the consequences of placing our trust in things of the world rather than trust in God. <clears throat> we live in this constant tension between earthly matters and kingdom matters. And I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes wonder for myself what my witness might be if I were as passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ as I am about fill in that blank. The Isaiah text today reminds us of our struggle, and it goes all the way back to that first commandment. In verse 5, he says, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. So remember the question I asked earlier? Where's your loyalty? Who is your God? What saves you? Who saves you? Things of this world will pass away, but his kingdom is eternal. So Jesus invites us to render to God the things that are God's. And he's not talking about the coin in your pocket. We are created in his image and called by name. There is no limit to what we should be rendering to God. We say in the offertory prayer, we offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Yet, what do we hold back? No part of our life is excluded. Render to God the things that are God's. I mean, Jesus rendered all that he was and all that he had. He emptied himself, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. But ha ha, death couldn't hold him down. Because of that, we've been given a new life, a new inscription, and it is child of God. We've been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that same Spirit gives us the power to live as Jesus did, imitating his faithful witness and walking in the ways of the Lord. Giving to God that which is his. Our devotion. Our worship. Our care and service to one another, to our neighbor. Our hearts giving to him our very lives for his use. Created in his image, the good news is he loves us. He forgives us. He has claimed us and will not let us go. We are his and he is ours. So I pray that as we leave here today, as we drive away, that we go as the Pharisees and the Herodians did, marveling marveling at God's mighty goodness and deeds. And that while we still reside here on earth, that we're always able to see how God is at work in and through all things. And then with joy, render to him all that we are and all that we have been given. His creation, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his son. I pray that for you and for me in Jesus' name. Amen.